Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. we got a great conversation today with Ron Mars. Ron, of course, you know his wonderful DC and Marvel work over the years. Uh, one of the great uh, creators of uh, Kyle Rayner, Green Lantern, and uh, so many other subsequent wonderful stories. He uh, just wrapped up a Kickstarter campaign for a book called Beasts of the Black Hand. It's diesel punk. It takes place around the World War I era. And uh, it's a fantastic historic science fiction pastiche that he did with Matthew Dow Smith and other collaborators. It's from Ominous Press, but uh, he used Kickstarter as kind of a proof of concept and uh, is just another great story about, uh, you know, doing creator own books and going the Kickstarter route, but also eventually going to be going the GoFundMe route. We talk about that on the interview. He hasn't uh, set up his GoFundMe account yet, but I'll give you a link to his uh, Ominous Press uh, shop website where you can uh, pick up Beasts of the Black Hand and support the book. But uh, it looks fantastic. It sounds great. And uh, it's another great opportunity to talk to uh, one of these great creators that made their mark at DC and Marvel and uh, continue to do great work now and uh, satisfy their uh, creator-owned comic uh, feed and need. Uh, and uh, I think produce really great books. So it'll be great to uh, check in with Ron Mars on today's Word Balloon. As we're talking, uh, they just made big uh, news. Uh, Marvel and Fox have uh, reached an agreement. I should say Disney and Fox. But let's be honest, the geeks are all excited about the Marvel-Fox deal. But, you know, I didn't realize, but it obviously makes sense. Planet of the Apes, Simpsons, uh, you know, all this other stuff that Fox produces is uh, going to fall under the Disney and therefore uh, Marvel umbrella as well. So the possibilities of some of the other th- great things that are coming up are pretty endless. And it's uh, it's a pretty interesting media merger. Um, again, obviously, the X-Men and the Avengers, uh, you know, finally colliding is an inevitability. Uh, there's a lot of great opportunities here. People are already asking Hugh Jackman, are you going to come back and play Wolverine one more time so you can uh, do it with the Avengers. And of course, he's like, no, (laughs) why not? Come on, let the guy, give the guy a break, man. The guy played Logan for 18 years. He wants to stop now. He ended on a good note with Logan and everything. But uh, no, it's a a very interesting and an exciting time. And uh, we're all going to sit and wonder how this will affect the movies, television, comics, all the different media outlets. So uh, pretty neat stuff. I'm sure uh, subsequent uh, guests will be uh, talking about these things and others in the uh, days and weeks ahead. But uh, Ron and I spoke before uh, the merger happened, so unfortunately it didn't come up. But you're going to love today's conversation with Ron Mars on Word Balloon. It's brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Now, a lot of the League uh, subscribed to Word Balloon via Patreon. There was an announcement a couple weeks ago that Patreon was going to go through this radical change that uh, was going to impact the uh, subscribers more than the content providers. And thankfully, everyone spoke up and voiced their displeasure at this move that was kind of made unilaterally without talking to the creators, the community of Patreon, as far as the content makers. And uh, thankfully, Patreon listened. They listened to uh, the patrons' complaints and also the creators' complaints. And uh, I just got an email yesterday saying, all right, never mind. We're not doing it that way. We heard you. And so that's great. So if there are people out there that, you know, were thinking about dropping their subscriptions or even not doing their subscriptions, uh, but trying to contribute in another way, I'm glad to say that uh, Patreon kind of came to their senses because it really hurts patrons at that dollar and two dollar level. And, you know, that's kind of dumb because we really don't want to impose much on our patrons uh, I know I'm speaking for the other creators as well. And, you know, whatever you can spare is really appreciated. So thank you for your support. Um, I didn't see a lot of uh, League members uh, dropping off, but some people did write me with concerns and, you know, wanted to get uh, their subscription money to me in a different way. But I'm glad to say that Patreon, as of Wednesday the 13th, decided not to do it. Um, it wasn't going to go into effect until the 18th anyway. So the good news is none of that is happening. So if you like Word Balloon, if you want to support the product, Patreon is still a great way to do that. You can go to patreon.com slash wordballoon or go to the wordballoon.com front page and click on the Patreon ad there. But thank you very much, everyone, who did express concern and also, more importantly, made their uh, you know wishes known to Patreon. And thankfully, Patreon listens. So 
I'm, I'm really glad. I, I, I think that Patreon was created, uh, you know, uh, with with the best interests of the, the content creators at heart. And I'm glad that they realized that that was a really dumb move. So uh, thank you for your support, as always, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by InStock Trades at InStockTrades.com. Let's look up some great Ron Mars material that you can find at InStock Trades. How about the uh, DC Dark Horse uh, crossover Aliens trade paperback that Ron did with Ian Edgington and Bernie Wrightson? Uh, this has Batman uh, going after the aliens. It's 45% off, $13.74. You can also get uh, things like the Justice League crossover, where uh, the Justice League takes on the Predators, and Batman teams up with Tarzan. That's uh, by Ron and uh, Pop Mihan. It's uh, 60% off. It's just uh, $9.99. You can get the Predator on Omnibus that has a lot of various writers, including Ron, in that book, it's uh, 55% off, $11.22. You can get Ron's uh, first uh, Green Lantern uh, trade, Green Lantern Kyle Rayner trade paperback, volume one. It's Ron and Bo Smith and Daryl Banks and other artists, but it's uh, the first chapters of uh, Kyle's run. It uh, starts with Green Lantern 48 through 57, 45% off, $16.49. Some of the great books you can find from Ron Mars at InStockTrades.com. Don't believe me? Check it out for yourself. It's, uh, you know, Christmas season. This is a great way to uh, spend some money on some gifts and get some great value in the process. InStockTrades.com. All right, without further ado, let's uh, pick up our conversation with uh, Ron Mars, uh, primarily talking about Beasts of the Black Hand and, uh, again, how, uh, how Kickstarter is working for Ron and how he is guiding his creator-owned comics career. Uh, a lot of talk about Omni- uh, Om- Onimus, uh, or pardon me, Ominous Press, uh, his publisher, and uh, his collaborators that are familiar uh, names. If you like your uh, Ron Mars stuff, uh, you're not going to be surprised at some of the guys that he's uh, hooked up with and continues to make great comics. But Matthew Dow Smith is uh, the great artist on Beasts of the Black Hand. And uh, I am a real fan of Matthews. Uh, eventually, I will get him on Word Balloon because he's a big ba- Doctor Who nut. And uh, I'm always happy to see him on great books like X-Files and this project as well. Beasts of the Black Hand. Let's talk to the author, Ron Mars, now on Word Balloon. It's interesting. To, obviously, these, these, uh, these Kickstarters are huge time sucks because you just have to... You know, you have to monitor them, but but yes. thankfully it's it it's sort of a halfway house because we're doing it through through Ominous Press, which is our you know our publishing company. So a lot of the heavy lifting is getting done by them, but still it's a you know it's an everyday thing. Um, but yeah. on the other hand, you know we sort of made I assume by the end of this will be at thirty two or thirty three thousand dollars. Okay, and you know sort of we made. You know, we we sat down and made our book and made that money appear out of thin air over a month's time. Sure. So, it's it's pretty great. Okay, is was can that be on the record or off the record? That comment, it's up to yeah, you. That can be on the record. Well, then we have begun. It's, you know, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I actually you no, know, I'm I'm happy to talk about the process because it's a it's a um, it's a learning experience for me as we as we do this too. Sure. Um, but the more I learn, the more I you know, the more I kind of think it's a, it will become an increasingly integral part of how people do create their own books. No question. And that honestly, Ron Mars, welcome to Word Balloon. This is why I have these conversations to help guide others who want to go the, the Kickstarter, uh, Indiegogo or GoFundMe routes, because it is, I think it is an evolving process. And, you know, there are guys that I think have the system beat or understand it well enough, like Jimmy Palmiotti I always point to. I think Paul Jenkins has done enough of these where he feels comfortable and understands the ins and outs and can, you know, get through the, the month of intense promotion and things like that. So, first of all, yeah, who are your godfathers in terms of doing this? Or have you done this enough yourself where, I don't even know, where where does this project, you know... Well, I'll, I'll give you the... I'll yeah. give you the whole the whole rundown yeah. on how Beast of the Black Hand came together, and then how it sort of went into a Kickstarter. Sure. Um, so, so Beast of the Black Hand is an idea, is a concept that my buddy uh, Paul Harding, who was a sculptor, had. Uh, Paul sculpts for DC and Sideshow and Gentle Giant and a bunch of other places, 
you know, he's also a two dimensional artist, but you know, he, his, he makes his living sculpting all sorts of cool statues and action figures and, you know, uh, movie props and you name it. Cool. So it's a, it's a pretty, you know, he's, you know, he's kind of like the magician among our group here upstate. Um, Cause he, you know, he makes this stuff appear literally out of thin air cause he sculpts everything with ZBrush now rather than by hand. Interesting. Um, and uh, which is, you know, is really the way the whole the whole sculpting industry has gone. So he, you know, Paul and I have been buddies for a number of years and we live, you know, half hour apart. And one day he came to me and said, hey, I got this, you know, I got this idea that I want to turn into a story. Um, and he laid it out for me. And that's what Beast of the Black Hand uh, eventually became. Uh, Paul had the, the title and the characters and the concept. And really the whole thing started because he wanted to sculpt some monsters. Um, he wanted to do. Uh, he wanted to, you know, sculpt some cool, mostly what he does in his, in his, you know, his day job is his real gig is, is a lot of superheroes, superheroes and villains and stuff like that, because that's what, you know, that's what the market wants. Sure. So in order to give himself an excuse to sculpt monsters, he came, came up with this concept, came to me and said, I, I think we should turn this into a story more than just, you know, here's some monster sculptures. So, um, I looked at it and thought, man, this is really cool. Let's let's do this. And it became kind of a, hey, let's get our buddies and do a story. So, um, you know, Matthew Dow Smith, who is drawing Beast of the Black Hand, um, is actually one of our close friends, too. And Matt actually used to live 10 minutes down the road from Paul. So he was, you know, he was part of our group here, too, until he moved to Washington, D.C., because his, his wife is a reporter at The Washington Post. Um, so this was really kind of getting together with your buddies and putting together the comic you wanted to do. Um, not for any other reason than, Hey, this is a cool story. Let's, let's have fun and do this. Um, it's not a, you know, it's not a disguised movie pitch. It's not a, you know, multimedia, multi-platform venture. It's just a cool story we wanted to tell. And certainly if any of that other stuff happens, hey, that's great. Sure. That would be tremendous. But it was not the motivating factor in putting this thing together. Um, so seeing as I'm, you know, part of Ominous Press, you know, a partner in the company as well as the editor in chief, I took it to the rest of Ominous, uh, principally Sean Husbar, who's our publisher, and said, hey, do you want to do this? Um, because I always feel like I should give ominous writer first refusal on anything I'm working on because I'm part of the company. Okay. And Sean saw it and thought, well, this is, you know, this is right up our alley. Let's do a Kickstarter and get this thing going. And so, you know, I, I don't know when Paul first came to me about the concept, maybe a year ago or something like that. But, you know, a year later we've got, we're on the, the, the last little bit of the Kickstarter and uh, we're fully funded and reaching for stretch goals. And then we'll, switch from a Kickstarter to Indiegogo for any stragglers. Okay. Um, and you know, we've got, we've got our graphic novel. Paul's done the sculpts. We've got, um, variant covers. We've got, uh, you know, we've got die cut bookmark. We've got a whole bunch of, you know, stuff for this thing that has really kind of come out of whole cloth. So it's, it's been a fascinating process for me to one, you know, have a chance to work with my buddies, which is the best part of the whole thing. Sure. And two, kind of, kind of delve into how, uh, how a lot of creator-owned books are being done in the industry now, which is crowdfunding. Um, you know, fewer and fewer publishers really want to shell out uh, any kind of serious uh, advance money or page rate money for you to do your your creator-owned book. Um, so this is becoming, I think the kind of the preferred method to allow your project to get off, to get off the launching pad. That's great, man. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm a huge, uh, Matthew Dow Smith art fan and is a guy that I briefly have met a few times at cons, uh, but, uh, I keep meaning to get him on word balloon. And this is another great example of, of his art as far as the interiors go. I see that Paul is doing, um, a sculpt cover. So is that like kind of a raised cover where I mean yeah describe what that is. The the sculpt cover is is Paul's it, it's a it's the cover features Paul's three D render 
of one of the monsters in the story. So, um, yeah, we would we would love to have it be a raised, uh, like a a embossed raised thing. I don't know that that's that's applicable or doable. We're we're definitely looking into it. So, is it like but, a hollow, but the, like a hollow uh, cover? Um, Hologram. Yeah, yeah, we're going to explore a couple different ways, but right now it's it's. It's. I think it's the first time a sculpt has been on a cover anywhere, um, because like I said, Paul does Paul does his work in a program called ZBrush, which means you're you know you're essentially rendering in 3D in the computer. Okay. So so this is a you know this is the the, the sculpt. This is the the 3D render of his sculpt reproduced on the cover, and uh, we're limiting that to a hundred copies. I think. Uh, and that'll be so. We've got two regular covers. We've got the Matthew Dow Smith cover, which is sort of the real iconic graphic-looking one. Sure. Um, and we just went over the. Uh, we actually just went over the uh, the threshold last night to uh, make sure that we can do spot varnish on that cover. Um, and then we have Paul's sculptural cover, and those are those two covers are the actual printed hard covers. Uh, and like, like I said, Paul's is limited to a hundred copies. Um, and I believe will be signed by Paul. And uh, then we have five other uh, variant covers that you can get as a dust jacket, um, which, you know, doing this as a uh, doing this as a hardcover allowed us some latitude of, well, you know, we don't it, you can have you're going to get your whatever cover you want. And then you're going to be able to wrap it in a dust jacket by um, Mark Laming, Eric Powell. Mike McCone, Megan Hetrick, or Mark A. Nelson. That's so, fantastic. Uh, so it it seemed like it was a you know uh, th- it seemed like we could kill two birds with one stone you know by offering uh, by offering dust jackets with with different images on it. Um, we're not doing we're, we're sort we're doing variant covers, but we're not really doing variant covers. Sure. Uh, yeah, and then and then and then all all seven covers will be are offered as a limited edition print set. Very cool. No, I think uh, I, again. I think the uh, because you're able to customize. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, as I have emphysema as we're talking. Clearly, um, <laughs> no, you're able to customize the, the customize these, uh, you know, dust jackets and stuff, and do well, do things that you know, again, a regular publishing venture can't do. But uh, but am I am I right in describing Paul's uh, sculpt cover? Is it like a holo, a hologram cover? Um, I, it's, it's, it, there's a, there's a depth to it. There's, there's the visual illusion of depth to it because it's a 3d sculpt. Right. Uh, but it, it is not an actual hologram. Um, maybe for, maybe for volume two, we can look at that. Uh, but, uh, it's, you know, it's really kind of cool to be able to make those sort of decisions sure. without anybody else really involved without, you know, without, uh, you know, without an editorial, like as far as an editorial structure, I'm it, man. Right. Like, yeah. like I'm writing it. I'm editing it. That's we're just sort of doing our own thing, and I and I've kind of fallen in love with that aspect of the process, um, from you know from editorial to to production because we're we're doing we're doing this as a as a nine by twelve hardcover, um, so it's essentially the same format that um, French albums come out in. Fantastic. Uh, Absolutely. Know, but, That's cool. Now, does Omnis so have? Like kind of a European, like you know, are they are they hip to the you know, or is the European market hip to anonymous, anonymous? Excuse me. Um, well, that's you know, that's the hope certainly that we'll you know attract. We'll them. find this more easily transportable to the European market because we're doing it in a in a format that that they're familiar with. Sure, and that that's the preferred format over there. Certainly here, if you do like through if you if you go through Diamond Previews and offer a. Uh, French style album, a lot of retailers don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to rack it. They, you know, it's it's an it's an odd size for them to deal with. Interesting, because they're they're you know they're not really equipped to to deal with it. They'd rather have you know a regular old comic size sure. uh, product. Um, I know that I think the most recent one that came out over here was the Terry Dodson Red One yes. set of of uh, hardcover albums. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so that was certainly part of the inspiration, you know. Besides just having a, you know, having a bunch of literal French and, and Belgian albums on my shelf here, <laughs> is that I, I I love that format. It allows you to do 
a bigger chunk of story, a more satisfying chunk of story. Um, and it's a really a more permanent format for your uh, for your story. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not the periodical format that's most embraced across the U.S. So I think, you know, doing this via Kickstarter, we've, you know, we've kind of chosen the format that we prefer rather than the one that the retail market demands. And being able to make that choice for, you know, for artistic reasons more than anything else is really pretty satisfying. Excellent. And I got to tell you, I am a big fan of just because my shelves are crowded and and I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, diminish the, the physical product. But I like the fact that, you know, 14 bucks, you get the story and it's, you know, uh, 48 pages of story, 64 pages digitally, 14 bucks. Such a deal. And, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> I'm glad you offer it that way as well. Because it's the thing, man. I, 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 first of all, I'm a diesel punk, punk fan. And I noticed this is set uh, in uh, the midst of uh, World War I. Um, and, you know, it's that combination of monsters and secret agents in the, ni- in the early 20th century. And again, diesel punk, where I do think that's a fun place to play. Because that's a little more technology than steampunk. But, again, you know, we're dealing with gasoline versus, or, you know, yeah, diesel, I guess, against, you know, yeah, it's, supernatural it's, and science fiction forces. It's it's our world and, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, but it's not quite our world. Sure. Uh, and, the you know, the, the notion that Paul had was that um, this is sort of the, this is sort of the, point of of uh, uh debarkation where okay because we're introducing monsters into a post world war 1 europe mm-hmm. um that spurs some technology growth and the technology uh, evolves is is a sort of yeah the technology evolves because we have this secret cabal known <laughs> as the black hand um introducing monsters so you know, so yeah, we we are historically accurate in the sense that the book starts out with the assassination of Rasputin, just as as far as we can tell, pretty close to how it actually happened, and and it also takes place um, at the Versailles Peace Conference in 1919. So we have all of this historically accurate information, and then we're introducing you know like monsters and diesel punk secret agents into it. Um, so it's a it's a you know it's it's sort of historical if you can accept that, you know, maybe assassinating Rasputin caused some monsters to show up. <laughs> well, and that's cool. That, that obviously ties into, I'm assuming, Russian mythology or at least European mythology of its time. But, you know, I love, even before the, the centennial of the First World War, I remember David McCallum, the historian, pointing out, how significant World War I was from a technological standpoint, and that it really was this leap from the 19th century. And it's easy to forget because um, the more refined tech versions of the technology happened in the decades following World War I, the 20s and the 30s. Radio became more sophisticated. Film certainly became more sophisticated. Aviation. And that's the thing. But all this stuff was there for World War I. And you just forget that that's the leap. And while there were still horses and, you know, uh, carriages and things like that, as well as the available technology, tanks, submarines, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, oh, you know, yeah, look where we were then. So it's an interesting time from a design standpoint and the realities of of these technologies. So I think that's a really good... Yeah, certainly, you know... the world was a far different place at the beginning of World War One compared to the end of World War One, yep. um, and it's, and it's not even you know you're not even talking about a a, a full decade, but um, you yeah, know that was years, one of those literally years, five years, nineteen fourteen to nineteen nineteen, yeah, of real you know of real growth and change in the world. <clears throat> so we're grafting, you know, we're grafting a sort of fantastical story on top of it, but. But most of the characters in the book are actual historical people. Um, most of the characters in the book are um, drawn from drawn from history and then embroidered a little bit. So we, you know, we've got Rasputin, we've got Maria Rasputin, his daughter, who's an actual historical person and led this weird life of being a you know a lion tamer and a dancer and a huh. you know, just 
like all of this stuff that I didn't know. Sure. All researched and came to me and said, how about this? And a lot of it I went, well, yeah, this is cool, but most of this stuff's ridiculous and we have to peel it back a little bit. <laughs> and then he went, no, that that's actually the, all the real stuff. Like the, the real stuff about Maria Rasputin being a lion tamer is, is, you know, the historical fact. That's the, you know, the, the, the fact that she's, you know, got a pet wolf that walks around with her is actually based on her having a pet wolf. That's crazy. Um, so it's, you know, so the, there's, there's crazy stuff in the story, but you know, a good chunk of it is, is, is real. The, 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 <laughs> our hero is named Oswald Rayner. Um, and I said to Paul, when he initially presented it to me, I said, well, okay, this is cool, but we can't obviously call this guy Rayner because people are just going to think I'm ripping myself off on Green Lantern. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then, then Paul, then Paul showed me, well, he's an actual dude and his, his name really was Oswald Rayner and he's probably the guy that actually killed Rasputin. So, you know, so I learned something and, and now have a, you know, and now have a, have a uh, appropriate deniability that I have, I'm writing a second hero with the last name of Rayner. That's your British secret agent uh, that's involved. Uh, wow, learning yeah, that about, you know, uh, go ahead. I, you know, a, a real guy and a, and I guess the odds are apparently the guy that actually was the one who disposed of Rasputin in 1916. That's insane. Maria Rasputin, now she replaces uh, Mussolini's son, who uh, was an incredible, for Italy, jazz musician and jazz expert, the son of the, uh, the, the, the yeah, World the, War II dictator. So now she replaces him as the weirdest uh, offspring of a significant historical uh, character with the lion tamer that, that, that beats being a jazz buff and everything. Definitely. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's just, it's just, uh, it was an education for me. So I guess hopefully it'll be an education for the readers, um, about a lot of this stuff. And I, I would, I would think that we've embroidered stuff enough here and there that it'll be pretty seamless in terms of what, what's real and what isn't. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a character in the, in the book named Henry Johnson, um, who is a an actual World War One decorated hero? Wow. Um, yet again, I didn't know who Henry Johnson was, despite the fact that here in upstate New York in Albany, I drive on Henry Johnson Boulevard on a fairly regular basis. <laughs> I didn't know who Henry Johnson was. <clears throat> Turns out, Henry Johnson, decorated World War One hero. Uh, who was from this area, from the Albany, Troy, Schenectady area, um, and has you know has had a fairly uh, large looming presence in Albany history, but I didn't know it. So he's he's part of the book too. Um, it's uh, you know really truth is obviously stranger than fiction, except for you know sixty foot monsters that end up rolling around in the story too. <laughs> well, and again. In the aftermath of World War I, uh, as I'm sure uh, the timeline of the centennial continues, uh, I'm sure we'll look back. But, you know, obviously Europe is in shambles after World War I. Reconstruction is going on. Uh, my correct countries are being created. Even then, I know it happened during World War II as well. But, you know, uh, they're, they're really kind of forcing a redesign of Europe uh, after the, uh, the peace treaty and everything. Is that correct? Yeah, it's you know it's you know it's not a coincidence that uh, you know the second half of the of volume one takes place at the Versailles uh, peace treaty uh, because that's where Europe was being created and frankly that's you know that's where the seeds of World War II were planted yep. when when everybody decided you know what we're gonna we're gonna screw Germany yeah fuck Germany and, you guys were uh, the cause of this and, and we're you know, really and I'm sure it'll be fine it won't cause any problems <laughs> in the future whatsoever. what could go wrong. Let's bring them to their knees, exactly, and humiliate them. Good idea. Um, so it's, you know, I, Paul and I are both big history buffs. Matt is, too, really, um, despite the fact that, you know, he's unfortunately the one that's got to draw all this stuff when we come up with it. When, <laughs> you know, when we decide, you know, you know Matt, the, the, last, the last scene of the book is going to take place out in the gardens of the, the, the incredibly in, intricate, incredibly huge gardens at Versailles, that's what you're going to have to draw. Uh, so, um, you know, all of this is, 
it hits a sweet spot for all three of us. Um, and our colorist is Niraj Menon, who is, uh, who is Indian, uh, and has worked with me on a number of projects. And, you know, so, so he's, he's, I guess Niraj is the only guy that doesn't qualify as a local since he's on the other side of the world. Okay. Uh, but, um, you know, he fits in seamlessly with, with the rest of us. And, um, this is actually the, it's actually the second time he's colored Matt. The first time was on a project that Matt and I did for a British publisher that never ended up seeing the light of day, but it was a great tryout for Niraj to color Matt. And so when this came up, I went, Oh, well I, I know who we got to get to color this thing. That's cool. And no, the examples that I see on the Kickstarter page, uh, both Matt's black and whites and, uh, Niraj's, uh, colors, uh, they look great. Uh, it's, no man, top top shelf uh, production, and uh, I love the I love the concept and I love the period. So uh, I, I think you guys are onto something here, and uh, certainly something that I think a lot of word balloon listeners might be interested in backing as well. And again, um, as we're recording, uh, we're literally in the last nine hours of the Kickstarter. Um, make sure you give me the Indiegogo URL, and we'll direct people to that page. Um, yeah, we'll get. The- We'll get the uh, we'll get the indie go go. Uh, that that seems to be you know again this is this is uh, a learning process for me. But apparently the you know the way you do this is um, you know indie go go. Uh, as you can tell, the school bus just pulled up in the yeah no problem. The uh, we're dogs good are, with the dogs. dogs are, we love we love dogs. The dogs uh, are really happy. The kids are home. Yeah, we like uh, we like, uh, we like dog soundtrack in the background. It's all good. Um, that's a little that's, so that's a little you know German Shepherd Rhapsody. There. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, so you do your, you do your Kickstarter and when that, when that ends, then you switch the campaign over to Indiegogo for any stragglers who, um, who didn't get in on the, uh, backing period. So it's, um, it's a, it's a learning process for me, but it's also, um, it's also pretty, uh, you know, I'm finding out that, that this Kickstarter stuff is, is both art and science. Uh, there's definitely, you know, there's definitely established norms that you follow, but also there's, you know, there's happenstance and there's, you know, there's figuring out, um, you know, which days you, uh, which days you start on, which days you end on, how long the campaign goes. Uh, it's a, you know, there, obviously there are people that do this as their full-time job, uh, running Kickstarters and, and getting things, um, getting things across the finish line. So, um, I'm, I'm enthused about the process. It's, it's a hell of a lot of work and it's a daily grind while your campaign is going on. But I, I would, uh, I would think that, uh, you know, you haven't seen the last of me doing a project on Kickstarter because it's, um, it's really a way to sort of go direct to customer, um, sure. and go, go direct to customer with whatever story you want to tell. Maybe that, you know, maybe that story isn't as enticing to uh, a publisher who's going to have to sink money into it. You know, certainly historical uh, historical stories are not huge on on a lot of publishers' lists because um, I don't know that there's as big an audience for it. And certainly, it's tougher to take your you know take your period era uh, comic book and turn it into a movie because doing a, doing a period movie is more expensive than just you know, shooting a cheapo horror film out on the street. Sure. Uh, those are just economic realities of, of both the movie business and the comic business these days. Um, but kind of going direct to customer is a, uh, it allows you some, uh, latitude that you maybe wouldn't have normally. Absolutely. Proof of concept, uh, finding your audience. Um, it's, uh, I, I'm assuming that I'm um, ominous, will you know uh, as I, I noticed that you don't seem to have um a selling way to stores to to you know buy through the kickstarter initially so i imagine again you're going directly to the audience and ominous will print accordingly i guess yeah well it's you know um the idea isn't to print the exact number of copies that we have for backers and then um and then never, never shall it be seen again. Um, you know, we'll bring these things to conventions. We'll, you know, sure. there will be ways to, to get your hands on this book. Um, 
but it's not you know and it's not an endless resource what you know we'll yeah. we'll do our print run and then unless there's crazy demand that'll be the end of it um until we get to hopefully a volume 2 which we're starting to pick away at now that this now that this one has been successfully funded we feel like okay well we've got a you know we've got a pretty good chance to do a volume 2 so we're putting some preview pages from volume 2 into the back of volume 1 uh, Matt Smith has already done a cover for volume two. So we're, um, we're hopefully going to turn this into, uh, at least, at least two graphic novels. And if, if it goes well, we're certainly happy to do more. Um, it's, uh, you know, like I said, it's, a, it's an ongoing process and learning curve, but it's, um, so far, no pun intended, very rewarding because we're, we're getting to tell the story that we want in the format that we want. And, uh, get it in front of people who uh, are willing to uh, are willing to back us. There's interesting um, premium pledges as well. Um, I noticed that uh, there is a uh, Vukari. Am I saying it right? Prototype sca- statue that yeah, that Paul yeah. is sculpting. You've got an original Mike McCone cover. I think for a very reasonable price, seven hundred bucks for an original cover. I think is very reasonable. And um, you know, so for people that want those kinds of, of high-end premiums, and also creating other uh, tchotchkes uh, that, you know, you, you know for, for the project as well. So that's, that's excellent. Well, it, yeah, I mean, my, my, um, my take on it at the beginning, and, and it's sort of borne out in this whole, in this whole process, is that, um, you know, you're when you do a Kickstarter, you, you are selling your product to, um, to kind of super fans, to people who are willing to, you know, plunk down their money, um, before they actually can look through the thing other than the preview pages that we've got, um, uh, that we've got online. Uh, and we're, you know, Matt's, uh, about six pages from finishing the entire thing. So, um, thanks to Ominous's involvement, we've been able to, um, get most of the book done even before the Kickstarter, uh, so that, uh, we can deliver it fairly quickly. The, the book should be in people's hands by February. Um, and really, um, that's only due to printer's holidays in, in December, kind of taking a couple of weeks of production and printing time off of the table. Sure. Uh, so I think we're, you know, we're in pretty good shape to, um, turn this around pretty quickly and hopefully volume two will be, um, will be the same way so that the, the gap between when your Kickstarter ends and you're funded and people actually getting their product is, is, you know, only a month or two rather than, you know, obviously some Kickstarters take a a year or two to get into people's hands. And that's obviously a situation we we wanted to avoid at all costs. At all costs. Again, the evolution of of people going this route, and how they're trying, you know, f- learning from others. You know, I wouldn't even call them mistakes, but just the realities of as this is a new way to sell comics, figuring it out and what's a better way, and can we, like you said, uh, limit the production time interval between completion of the campaign? God, I, I my a lot of my friends are still, you know. Uh, providing uh kickstarter you know not not the product itself but some other kind of premiums and stuff you know a year or two after the the campaign ended and thankfully the patrons are all patient and you know willing to willing to wait for the goods and stuff like that but yeah you know and and other other projects come in and and that might you know interfere with production time so again i ask uh, i asked at the beginning um do you have kickstarter and uh, this kind of crowdfunding uh, godfathers that you kind of talk to for advice? Oh yeah, definitely. You know, I I talk to talk to a number of people. Um, name some and, people. And, I always want yeah, I always want to hear the um, names who, who's who's got the smarts. <laughs> well, sir, I you know I I think you know the guy you mentioned, Jimmy Palmiotti, is has done really really well on Kickstarter and is is very smart about how he does it. Um, you know, Jimmy's writing partner Justin Gray has also done a sure, number of Kickstarters. Uh, we've talked to the guys at uh, Space Goat. We talked to the guys at uh, cool. Stranger Comics, um, and certainly we talked to uh, 
at great length, um, IDW, which has yes. had huge success doing games uh, via Kickstarter, um, and some of the guys that they have partnered with to, to do campaigns. So we we absolutely collected our you know did our due diligence, collected our information, um, and then uh, Ominous helped out a lot with um, with uh, the Kickstarter for the Bart Sears Drawing Par- Powerful Heroes how to draw book that, that Bart did oh, cool. um, as well as the, um, as well as a Bart Sears art book of about a hundred pages. Um, both of those got done. Um, both of those got um, funded in late spring, early summer. And those books are actually at press now, which is a little longer than we would have liked certainly. And, and that was, you know, that was part of the learning curve. Sure. And I chipped in on some of that stuff where you go, oh, this 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 takes a lot longer than you think, and then, um, and then uh, you know, acts of God also come into the come into the the the, uh, the equation. Um, you know, Bart had to evacuate Florida because of uh, the hurricane. Okay, yeah. so okay, wow. there there goes a week. Uh, Bart got in a car accident. Oh man, there goes a couple of weeks. Oh my so, god. Um, so. Yeah, I mean he's he's he right? he's was banged up pretty good, but and ultimately, you know, he's okay. Nothing broken, good. nothing um nothing um that that put him in the hospital, but still banged around really good and and you know, if your if your back is screwed up enough that you know, your job is to sit down and draw for 8 or 10 or 12 hours a day, but you can't actually sit that long because you've been banged around in a car accident, that takes, you know, that takes time out of the out of the whole thing. So um, you know, but literally those books are, I were on the printing press yesterday. I don't know if the entire run is done yet, but, um, they're going into boxes today and tomorrow and we'll, we'll, we'll ship to, to ominous press in Buffalo, uh, where thankfully, you know, the, our sister companies of, uh, slab pro and sleeping giant ventures, which are also owned by Sean Husvar, you know, there's, there's a, there's a support staff in place that will help with the fulfillment and envelope stuffing and all that. So, um, in, in doing the research to, to do a Kickstarter and that's, that's the, the biggest thing that across the board, everybody said is it takes longer than you think it's going to, right. It takes more time every day than you think it's going to. And number one on the list, fulfillment sucks. (laughs) Like fulfillment is just is just a you know is just a grind that is going to uh, wear you to a nub for a week or two weeks or however long um, it takes you to get everything out. Uh, so so having all having heard all of that, we certainly got to a place where we went, you know, we're going to have other people helping us do this. Uh, you know, we're going to have uh, employees from from Sean's other businesses stepping in and doing uh, a, a big chunk of the work the heavy lifting, uh, yeah. because it's, it, you know, it's, if, man, if this stuff was just showing up, you know, on a UPS truck to my garage and it was me stuffing envelopes, that would be a bad scene, man. I hear you, uh, dude. No, I know, you know, I know be, people that are still be, doing it there, that way. Yeah. There would be no other work getting done for a month. Sure. No, totally understand. And again, uh, as someone that is creating things as well, that is my fear. <laughs> About, you know, and people are like, why don't you just crowdfund a novel? Why don't you just crowdfund a comic? And I'm like, oh, man, I just, I hear the horror stories from you guys and stuff. And, I mean, and they're legit because, again, it, it's it's truly becomes a full-time job. And if you've got another full-time job or other freelance things that you're doing, really hard to shoehorn in the time. So it's good that you do have the infrastructure of Ominous to help you facilitate this. So what other books have you been doing yeah. for, for Omni- uh, Ominous? Um, well, so Ominous has kind of two, two branches for now, and, and ultimately there will probably be more branches on the tree. But Ominous Press was initially the, you know, the brainchild of Bart Sears, and he had a publishing company 20 years ago, did some books. Um, and when the market imploded in you know, the mid-90s, thanks to oversaturation sure. and so over-speculation and all that, um, Ominous like a uh, – like a great many publishers, you know, went the way of the, you know, went the way of the dodo. Sure. 
Um, so here we are 20, 20 years later. Um, Sean Husbar was part of Ominous back then. You know, when Ominous folded, he went off and did, you know, did things in the real world and, and founded companies and uh, grew companies and sold companies and actually, you know, did, did real things in the real, real world in a business sense um, and became uh, successful enough that he could come back to us and say, hey, you guys want to do Ominous again? What do you think? That's great. And it, and it, grew, it grew from me and Bart and Andy Smith doing a miniseries. Um, to bring back some of those characters to jumping into the deep end of the pool and saying, well, let's, if we're going to do this. Let's do this. Let's have a publishing company and let's have multiple titles. Uh, let's, let's make this, um, let's make this a focus. So, um, that's, you know, that's the plan. We're partnered with, uh, IDW as our publishing partner cool. for, um, for the books that we're doing. So uh, right now, the the first Ominous Press miniseries is is uh, coming out, which is Dread Gods, um, which is about sort of the, you know it's kind of uh, a Mad Max wasteland sort of meets a a video game world of Greek gods um, huh. and the questions of which reality is real, which you know. If the if the entire population plugs into this experience every day, is that more real than the sort of world of want and hunger that they live in? Um, Interesting. So that's by me and Tom Tom Ranny. Oh sure, cool. Uh, who is really good? Yeah, he is. Uh, and one of a guy that I worked with, you know, literally twenty five years ago on some Silver Surfer issues, and. Um, so that's <clears throat> Dread Gods is coming out right now. Uh, as of yesterday, uh, Giant Killers number zero came out from IDW. Cool. Uh, that is uh, setting the stage for the uh, eventual Giant Killers series that Bart Sears will write and draw. Um, and then uh, the third miniseries that will come out uh, from Ominous and IDW is Demigod, uh, which I'm writing and Andy Smith is drawing. And that's uh, a little bit. That's a little more contemporary, set in the set in the near future, um, which is kind of what of a slacker jerk gets the power of a god. Um, <laughs> in in this case, you know, great power does not come with great responsibility. It comes with great power. Kind of turns into being a great big ass. <laughs> uh, great indulgence. So all right, cool. <clears throat> um, yeah. So. Um, so that's kind of the ominous universe stuff that we're doing, and that's the initial phase of that. That's great. And we'll have other, we'll have other other series and other one shots that are part of that cohesive universe, and then we're doing this ominous presents stuff, which is um, Beast Beast of the Black Hand is really the first product from that from that angle of the company. Um, and it's going to be for create our own work and work that we bring in from, from outside that doesn't have anything to do with, uh, the ominous characters in the ominous universe. So, um, we'll have, we'll have both aspects and hopefully we'll keep them both go both going at once. We've got a, we've got kind of a schedule of, of projects that we're going to do, um, starting in the new year. um, some art books, some mini series, some graphic novels. So hopefully it'll be a fairly, um, fairly ominous presents will be a fairly eclectic bunch of, of, uh, titles and, uh, and concepts, um, kind of, um, pulled together through the, through the notion of, you know, we love comics and we love the art of comics. Uh, and so we're we're going to be drawn to projects that really show off um, the visual aspect of of comics. It's you know we're not going to do uh, we're not going to do stories that are twenty pages of talking heads. I'm we're going to get you know splashes and double spreads, and we're going to you know we're going to give the artists room to show off um, on whatever we do. Uh, that doesn't mean you know that doesn't mean the storytelling gets gets left in the way. Exactly. That just means we've got an eye on making sure that these are intriguing character driven stories, but that they're also as visually stunning as we can make them. And, and that's actually one of the reasons that we went to the larger hardcover format for beast of the black hand is, 
you know, God, you know, there's there's so much there's so much effort and talent that goes into making every page of a comic. We want it to be as big and as bold and as as enticing as we can possibly make it. That's that's outstanding, man. That's the key: is don't sacrifice story for the sumptuous art, and having that ba- balance and everything. And you know, again, uh, veterans like yourselves understand that that's what makes the best comics. So. No, it sounds it sounds terrific, and uh, I'm really glad that uh, Ominous is back, and that you guys have a laboratory to play in, and uh, you know are able to realize uh, your dreams yeah, like this. There's there's definitely there's definitely going to be more. I am I am writing pages today of something for an artist that I have worked with on a number of projects previously um, that will be out in 2018 but i can't tell you what it is yet uh but just you know just the the ability to uh, you know it's i think it's a really interesting time in comics and again uh, partially thankful partially thankfully to kickstarter partially thankfully to just the you know the fact that you can put stuff on the web and reach an audience um it it's kind of like the wild west because sure you know the, the the old distribution models are still in place but they're not the only ones in yep. place. Um, you can do, you can do what you want to do if you can find a way to lead the audience to it. And and certainly the my Kickstarter experience so far has been that uh, the biggest aspect of the entire proposition is just letting people know about it. Um, if you let if if you can lead people to your Kickstarter, you're going to be okay. You're, you're going to get enough pledges to keep you floating. Um, it's just it, it's so it's more a matter of outreach than than trying to talk people into throwing a couple of bucks in for a project. Um, it's it's a matter of getting getting people aware of what you're doing uh, much more than convincing them to uh, to actually plunk down money. Once they're aware, you get enough of a, re- of a response to to keep the whole thing. Um, to keep the whole thing running on a regular basis. It's, it's, uh, it, you know, and I, and I certainly don't mean to say that, you know, look, I'm still going to do work for hire for other places. I'm, I'm taking over fathom next year for, for Aspen. Oh, that's great. Uh, there's some other stuff in the pipeline. So, you know, that's one of the nice things as a writer is you get to juggle, um, you get to juggle different things and, and, you know, play in different pools or, or I, I usually refer to it as, you know, you're able to keep a number of different plates spinning at the same time. Um, so I don't mean to, you know, say, oh, you know, Kickstarter is the future and don't ever, you know, don't ever go do, you know, mainstream. go do work for a mainstream publisher again. That's certainly not the case. Of not. You know, it's to me, it's all, you know, it's all part of the same smorgasbord and and you get to. You know, you get to sample the dishes that you like, and you keep coming back to the ones that you find are are the best fit for you. I always quote uh, Jonathan Hickman when he said, uh, "Comics are on the same shelves in direct market stores, but they're there for different reasons. Your book is there for a different reason than a DC or a Marvel book, and that's that's great. And you're right; it is a smorgasbord at this point. And you know, I did this business seminar yesterday as we're recording uh, for my buddy Saul Colt. And Saul used to be an indie comic publisher, had a really great, has a really great sense of humor, and really left, uh, you know, he put his books out in like 2006 to 2008. And he even said, you know, I, I, I ended up not liking the direct market system, and it really kind of soured me. I, he's like, I don't go to comic stores anymore because of my frustrations as an independent publisher. But he didn't have the tools that are available and the platforms that are available that you're, you know, you know, investigating and using. And that's, like you said, it is a really interesting time in comics. And I told him that as well. And I almost hope that he still has his digital files and might reconsider putting his stuff out. He's a really smart marketing guy and has gone full f- force into the business world. And he just had me on. I told you off the air as a rep of, you know, somebody surviving in this gig economy and uh, you know the pitfalls, and also the the benefits and the, the the genuine rewards, creatively and and sometimes monetarily as well. So it it is an interesting time. And, yeah, well, you know, there's there's um, there are so many more tools in the toolbox for creators now than there were even ten years yep. ago. Uh, 
it's a, it's a whole different landscape. And and I I come back on a regular basis to one of the things that was a a mantra at CrossGen 15 years ago. Um, CrossGen, which you know had a had a few years of 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 glorious solvency and then disappeared beneath the waves yes. because the, the business aspect of it was managed well. But one of the things that was, um, that was stress there. And I keep coming back to, because it's the, it's, it's really smart is that if you, if you can create something once and sell it in a bunch of different packages, you're going to hit a bunch of different audiences. Sure. Um, so, so, Comics are um, are not a one size fits all medium. Uh, so, look, some people want a French style hardcover. Some people want uh, a regular floppy. Some people want, you know, the trade paperback uh, so that they can read the whole story at once. And some people want to press a button and get get it digitally every Wednesday. Yep. Um, I think comics are growing into that into a uh, a form where you tell your story in the best way and the best format you can, and then try to get it into as many different buckets as possible so that, so that the largest number of people can find what you do. Uh, it, it just seems like, you know, that's the, that's the way of the future that's the secret. is, is yeah. figuring, figuring out how to appeal. You know, you, you can't tell people this is what, you know, this is the format I'm doing it in. It's the only format I'm doing it in. And you have to go to this store to buy it. That's not a realistic uh, business plan anymore because uh, comics have outgrown that. Right. And again, so, people are coming you know, to comics I, and, and I often, in a different way. Go on. I'm sorry, uh, Ron. Go on. Well, I, I was going I was going to say, I, you know, I, and I, I've often, you know, had the conversation with, with other pros, with my partners at Ominous. Um, any of it is that uh, if you, if you if your plan is to do comics and only sell them in the direct market through Diamond, you might as well just take your money out in the street and you know throw it, throw the it to the winds and watch people fight for it <laughs> because you're going to get about the same return. Yes, you you can't just do one thing, put all your eggs in that basket, and then you know sort of hope that it'll work. Hope that enough of an audience finds you. Um, you have to you have to spread it around to as many different places as possible, and try to reach as many different people as possible. Um, I think you you know you you tell the story you want to tell, but then you offer it up in as many different ways as you can. We got to find a um, a general history audience and a way to approach them because I do think I'm working on a project that has a historical backdrop, a uh, different era than than what you're doing. Uh, not too far up in the future. It, it takes place in the in the early '30s. Uh, but yeah, I, I just I do think in the same way that ten years ago we were saying, or even fifteen years ago, we were saying, God, we got to get the crime comics to the noir fans that go to the bookstores, the mystery shops, and you know, Brew Baker's Criminal and Gotham Central with Rucka and Brew Baker need to need to be sitting next to the Ed McBain books. And the Dashiell Hammett stuff, because that audience would really love what these guys are doing. And, um, you know, that's so are you I mean, again, it's slightly fictional. I asked this of Rucka when he was doing his um, steampunk comic a couple years ago with uh, Rick, uh, Rich Burchett and wondering if, you know, again, how do you how do you get to the diesel punk audience and, you know, things like that? Are there different, uh, you know, avenues that you are trying to let people know that are diesel punk fans, Hey, you should check this out. Yeah. It's, you know, look, it's, it's word of mouth. Sure. It's, it's every, you know, every reader you get, hopefully tell somebody else. Um, and I think, you know, thankfully Paul and Matt and I have at least some track record in, in the business no as storytellers. Yes. And, um, hopefully that gives us the benefit of the doubt for something, you know, to, to come out with something in a, in a little bit different format and a little bit different kind of story. Um, you know, I, you, the, the old, the old saw I think is, is still kind of applicable. Um, because when I broke into the business, you, you worked at Marvel and DC to kind of build up your name and build up your profile. And then you went off and did some creator own. Sure. 
Um, that was the that was the way of the world. Um, so you you hoped to work at Marvel in DC, establish yourself enough that you could go tell the kind of story that you want to tell for Dark Horse or Image or someplace else. Um, for a while, it became the opposite. It became you went and did creator own work so that you could hopefully get noticed by Marvel in DC, sure. and then they would harvest you like a crop, um, <laughs> which 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 always seemed to me oh and you could you can certainly see you know every once you know every 12 or 18 months marvel and dc would would harvest writers and artists and some of them made it and stuck around and some of them didn't um and it, it was always kind of fun for uh you know the established pros to look at oh you know here there's a new crop who do you think is going to last and who do you think is going to be gone in two years um <laughs> so that that always seemed kind of bass backwards to me is that you know you 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 did your creator own stuff the stuff that was supposed to be nearest and dearest to your heart so that you could go work on work for hire and you know have editorial looking over your shoulder um now i think we're in we're in a we're in a little bit different world where nothing's 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 like it was 10 years ago and certainly nothing's like it was 20 years ago it's it's there i think there's more um, it's more of a two-way street in terms of, of working, doing work for hire at the same time as you're doing uh, your uh, your creator own stuff. It, it, now that's it's it's more of a stew now than I think it it ever has been, because so many creators are doing both. So many creators have come to the conclusion that you have to have you have to have creator own stuff and personal stuff alongside the more commercial work for higher stuff to to kind of build your portfolio absolutely and and again it, very interesting time jim zub was just on a couple episodes ago saying the exact same things that you're saying in terms of don't just create for the direct market make sure you're going to all these different platforms make sure that you are you know ticking all the the boxes and everything to get your 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 product to as many eyeballs as you can i want to switch things up and talk about uh, you know the two latest movies that have come out as we wrap things up here. What have you have you seen Ragnarok? Have you seen Justice League? Um, <laughs> this might come as a shock to you, John, but I work in comics, so I don't leave the house. Okay, no problem. You haven't seen uh, them yet. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't seen them. Um, it's uh, Will you see them. You know, it, it's kind of it's kind of a truism. I, and look, I know there are a lot of pros that go out and first weekend they they got to see the stuff. Like I, I'll I'll see them both certainly, but um, you know most of the time you're in the air, you're you're in the chair twelve or fourteen or sixteen hours a day. Make the donuts, and particularly when you're when you're part of a Kickstarter campaign, True. you you are definitely in the chair that long. That's a good point. So, um, so uh, yeah, as you want, you once you become a comics pro, you have less time to read comics and less time to watch comic book movies. <laughs> uh, that is that is unfortunately the the you know the unvarnished truth and and I think um, I think the the weekend that Ragnarok came out I did go to the movies but it was to catch up on Blade Runner twenty forty nine which I still hadn't seen See, yet. and I haven't seen that um, yet so I understand and I, want, I totally understand uh, and I wanted to make sure that I saw that on the big screen before it before it snuck away um, so yeah I mean these are <clears throat> these are adult decisions. Um, <laughs> That you have to make. I mean, this is, you know, do I sit here and finish these pages so the artist has something to work on tomorrow? Or do I go, you know, or do I go watch Thor and the Hulk beat the living crap out of each other? I understand. Um, Absolutely, man. Or binge, or binge watch The Punisher, for uh, that matter. Um, yeah, man, I'm, I'm so far behind on Marvel TV series and, and TV series Agreed. in general. Uh, like, I, I will never catch up. <laughs> uh, so I... So I it's you know I'm, I'm getting to this I'm getting to the point where you're going, huh? Are there enough years in my life left for me to actually watch all these things? <laughs> uh, you know, can can I actually read all of these books that are piled up on my office floor? Uh, you know, before they before they find me, you know, under over. <laughs> under a collapsed pile of books that uh, that has finally teetered over. Um, so you know, and I got to say, like none of this is a complaint. I understand, it's man. just you know that's just the way it's it the is. Um, Absolutely, man. It, like I, you know, I, I, I have you know, I have friends who are, you know, in the business as well who are younger than me and are like having their first kids now. And 
And I go, well, I hope you enjoyed going to the movies and watching TV and playing <laughs> video games while you could. Cause that's all over with. I hear you, man. Like, that's not, you know, that's not a thing that you're going to work and you're going to take care of your kids. That's about it. And for a few years, that's the way it goes. Uh, now my kids are a little older. So with the exception of, you know, running to running them to various sports practices, there's a little bit more time. But, um, you know, I, there's there, there have been a number of scripts that have been, you know, that have been written, you know, in the stands at my my kids, Babe Ruth baseball games. I completely understand that. And and yes, and there you go. This is the this is the future life of geek parents as they as they really get further into adulthood and the realities being uncle buck single and happy and you know not having the responsibilities <laughs> of, of child rearing and stuff uh i still can sneak out in between my my freelance gigs so i i do understand and and you know again it's a good choice uh, you know you're, ra- you're raising children you're doing good things and again you're making the donuts and entertaining us with your own geek uh products so that's that's excellent. That's what we want from Ron Mars. We don't want him sitting in the uh, movie theater. We want him making excellent books. Beasts of the Black Hand, the graphic novel, uh, transitioning now to the Indiegogo campaign because uh, as as this will be published next week, um, you know the the Kickstarter is over, but that doesn't mean that you can't get behind this project. And uh, man, it looks great. And like I said, I'm certainly excited about the story itself. And it's that great combination of great writing and great art. So uh, congratulations, and I'm glad you've reached your goal and are allowing people to jump on through Indiegogo and eventually uh, when it might make its way into the direct market. But support this thing and and check it out and uh, purchase it through the uh, digital channels of crowdfunding that uh, Omnibus Omnibus Press, easy to say when you're on uh, full eight hours of sleep, uh, (laughs) but uh, no, man, I honestly, I'm really, I'm glad you're doing this. It looks great. And happy to help uh, promote it and wish you guys uh, continued success beyond uh, Volume 1, that hopefully a Volume 2 will happen and more of this stuff will come out as well. But uh, always a pleasure, dude. We figured, you know, we let Matt do a Volume 2 cover, and now we have to do Volume 2. So uh, it's, uh, oh, there are always more stories to tell, and thankfully, you know, it looks like there's an audience for it so far. So, um, you know, we'll we'll keep at it as long as somebody wants us to. And and you know, a huge appreciation to you for letting me come on and you know run my app for a while. Absolutely, man. No, I, you know, hey, I'm always happy when we see each other face to face. And Skype to Skype works as well. And I look forward to our next conversation. Brilliant. Thanks, John. Ron Mars, check out Beasts of the Black Hand from Omin- Ominous Man, Ominous Press. <laughs> I have trouble with that word this early in the morning. I can't deny it, but it's a great book. You can't spell it, but it sure eats good, as Richard Franzowitz said in uh, The Natural, the Robert Redford baseball movie. Beast of the Black Hand, uh, it looks fantastic, and I uh, can't uh, recommend it more. So uh, check out the website at uh, uh, ominouspress.myshopify.com, and uh, you'll find the book and a lot of other swag over there as well to uh, support this project. Thanks for listening to Word Balloon. Uh, Great conversation. More to come in December. Uh, I've been a little busy with uh, the radio job, but uh, I promise uh, we got great interviews coming up. And, uh, you know, you heard about Bendis and uh, Bendis' illness. My heart goes out to my buddy. Uh, You know, obviously he is healing up. Uh, That uh, Bendis Tapes new uh, conversation will come with, unfortunately, more news about Brian's health along with uh, his uh, move to D.C. and some of the things that have been going on this fall and early winter. But, uh, you know, yeah, thank God uh, the guy's okay and is healing and under uh, medical care to uh, get well again. What a, what a scary thing to go through. So, uh, I, you know, I, what else can I say other than get well, Brian, and we're all rooting for you. Word Balloon today was brought to you by InStock Trades and InStockTrades.com. More uh, Ron Mars stuff from InStock Trades. Ron did a lot of work at uh, Top Cow, uh, guiding their universe, and was one of the main architects uh, back then. You can find volumes of uh, Witchblade and Artifacts and Magdalena and other great characters by uh, Ron Mars at 45% off the various volumes at InStockTrades.com. You can also find other great collections as well. He did John Carter, Warlord of Mars. You can get the first volumes of that, one and two. 37% off, $12.49 for uh, those books. 
at InStockTrades.com. Uh, there's Ravine, Stepan uh, Sedgik and Ron Mars uh, together uh, doing uh, some great fantasy work here. It's 45% off and just $8.24. Lots of Ron Mars stuff waiting for you at InStockTrades.com. Go check it out. You'll find great books at great prices. If your orders are $50 or more, you'll receive free shipping from InStockTrades.com. Thanks for listening to Word Balloon. I'll be back in a few days with another new episode. But uh, thanks for uh, enjoying the show and a great year. Uh, A very uh, scary 2017. That's where it started. But uh, things are uh, getting very interesting as uh, the year wraps up. And I will uh, continue to make you abreast of what's going on in the Word Balloon universe as uh, the situation develops. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2017.